one of our recent studies that we did, it was a little bit different. Uh, we got some novel results out of it, and I personally thought it was kind of exciting, but I get excited about weird things. So, um, we, you guys have heard this. We're going to keep beating it over the head. Um, we've had this Romans uh, report. We know that nitrogen deposition is happening in the park. We may or may not be uh, understood how much is coming from the various sources, how much is coming from livestock. But obviously there is a need and a drive to be looking at all the options that we can for ways to reduce uh, nitrogen emissions from livestock operations. Okay, And so obviously if we reduce our emissions, we reduce the chances that it may be heading up towards the park. Okay, Now traditionally, um, and you heard Jay talk a lot about this this morning, if you don't bring the nitrogen into the system, it's not going to have the chance to be emitted. Okay, So obviously looking at feed protein nitrogen that's in our feed stuff that we're bringing into our operations, the animals that we're bringing in, other things like that, that would be an obvious way. Okay, but that may be problematic. Now, traditionally, we've looked at uh, is there different ways we could feed the protein, different forms of feeding the protein, and we'll, we'll go back, we'll circle around to that towards the end of the talk. Okay, and in particular, just feeding less protein may not actually solve the problem, particularly if you increase days on feed, you have those animals present in the feeding operation for a longer period of time, you're feeding for their maintenance needs, as well as our growth needs, a lot of things are going to go into that. Okay. Now, the other thing that um, Jay mentioned this morning is one of the ideas is that there are very particular times of the year when we may be more concerned about nitrogen emissions because the wind may be blowing in the directions where it could take that nitrogen to a sensitive area like Rocky Mountain National Park. So. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have Jay to work with, and he came to me and said, hey, can we think of some management techniques to look at um, reducing nitrogen emissions? And in particular, what I was focused on this was, what are things that could have a pretty rapid impact uh, that we could do maybe for a portion of the year at different times of the year? Um, and really where I went at this study was looking at um, some various pharmaceutical agents. Okay, and in particular, there's some new emerging growth promotants out there in the market, primarily the beta agonists, um, that may help to improve muscle accretion, muscle deposition. And as we increase that, we're going to start to stimulate the nitrogen that's retained within the animal and not lost in the excreta because most of the a large portion of the nitrogen that that animal is consuming, um, if it's being absorbed and utilized by the animal, it's probably going to be retained within that lean tissue growth. Not so much in fat or adipose growth, but in that lean muscle tissue. So when we add these compounds like beta agonists, like ractopamine, um, it may stimulate more rapid, more uh, expanded growth of that muscle tissue. Now, the other thing that we're still learning a lot about is how these uh, new emerging growth technologies like beta agonists may interact with some of the things that we've used for a long time. Okay, In particular, our steroidal implants, which have been around since the 1950s. Okay, They're very widely used within the livestock industry, but we're still learning more and more all the time about how um, they may interact with some of these new technologies. Okay, So our overall idea is that rectopamine, which is this beta agonist, make them grow bigger, more muscly, okay, with or without the steroidal implants, would help to lessen nitrogen excretions by stimulating a, a shift in uh, accretion uh, to lean tissue rather than to the, that adipose tissue. So it, for, to get real specific about how we were going to approach that, uh, we were looking at these cattle that we had implanted with a trimbolone acetate estradiol benzoate implant and with or without uh, ractopamine. Now, where this study is going to be a little bit different from some of the others you may find in the literature is how we were actually implanting the animals. Okay. Now, 
Traditionally, we're going to implant our animals. We may re-implant them. And the idea is that you're getting the maximum amount of those hormones absorbed out of the implant into the animal to stimulate growth changes, get a larger animal, and that most of it's used up by the time that animal goes to harvest. Okay? So the implants we were using here uh, were Cinevex Plus implants. Okay? Not, not the most aggressive, not the least aggressive. I'm trying to pick something kind of in the middle of the road. And we implanted these animals so that they would be about halfway through the lifetime of, of that implant, okay, when they started receiving the uh, ractopamine. Because again, these new growth promoting agents, uh, they can only be fed for a certain period of time where they're cost effective and meet label requirements. So they're typically just fed on average for around the last 28 days in a feedlot system. Okay, so we had set up the study with 24 Herford Angus cross steers. They were putting a, a two by two factorial arrangement of treatments. Okay, so you had your control animals, didn't receive ractopamine, didn't receive implants. You had some that just received the ractopamine, some that were just implanted, and some that got the double whammy and got both implants and the uh, beta agonist. Okay. Did this research up at our Ardec facility in uh, Wellington, Colorado. Uh, we started off with 36 of these animals. Uh, a couple of you have done balance trials before. Look at Andy in the back. There's always some that are not going to work well with you and you know, try and kick your head off. Okay, so we try and get those kind of animals out. Uh, try and get the best animals that we can. Um, the genetics we were working with here. Uh, these cattle are. They're CSU cattle that, that have been selected for high marbling, okay? And these animals have some great carcass characteristics. They are a complete pain to manage, okay? They have really big rumens. They grow very slow. Um, so they were actually on feed for quite a while, okay? Um, and the whole time we had them in the feedlot, we started working with them to acclimate them to human contact, things like that. Um, started them off in large dry lot pens, and then once we started doing our individual treatments, we moved them into individual feeding situations. Okay, um, did a lot of stuff to try and maintain health on these animals. Okay, and about 137 days in there, we really started figuring out which of those animals we were really gonna use for this study. Okay, worked with them, and we blocked them into a light group and a heavy group, mainly because our barn couldn't hold all the animals that we were going to use, so we had to split it up over two different times. Okay, here's my grad student who actually did all this work. I just kind of told her what to do. Um, and she did a great job working with these animals, um, getting them used to some of the equipment, our fecal bags, things like that. And so by the time we actually went into the barn, these things were pretty much like puppies. Okay, so here's what our animals look like with the uh, collection device. And so when we were going to go look at how the nutrients were going to be excreted, okay, there's a lot of different ways we can do this. Uh, we can use markers. There's lots of different technologies we can use to try and estimate nutrient emissions from livestock. To me, to this day, still the best way is if you want to know how much urine's come, or how much nitrogen is coming out in the urine, go collect all the urine. Okay? You want to know how much is coming in the feces, go collect all the feces. Okay, it's not very fun, it's not very glamorous, but to me it's still the best way to figure it out. Okay, so we separated these guys out a week from when we implanted them so that they would be at the same t time point post-implant when they actually went in the barn and we took our measurements. Okay, they were individually fed, they uh, received their rectopamine treatment as a top dress. Basically we took about a pound of corn and had blended in the ractopamine, put it on top of about another pound of the ration they were going to be offered for that day. They didn't get the rest of their food until they had finished consuming all the products so that we knew they are actually getting this compound into them. Um, so we could hopefully be relatively certain that our effects were going to be due to them actually consuming that product. Okay. Then did our balance trial, did total collections of urine, feces over six days, retained about 10% of it, all the excreta. Okay. Um, at the end of the day, um, did our basics, 
analyses of how to measure nitrogen retention, nitrogen excretion. Um, our steer was our individual our experimental unit. And I'm not going to bore you with a whole bunch of different slides and stuff, but basically what it came down to uh, was the steers that were fed the ractopamine treatment tended to have a lower dry matter intake compared to the uh, steers that were fed the other treatments. I don't know if this was a palatability issue, something else was happening here. It wasn't a huge impact, uh, but there did tend to be a, a decrease in their intake. We didn't see any real large decreases in nitrogen intake, so nitrogen into the system, okay, and fecal in, but the, you did tend to see a slight numerical drop that kind of reflected that slight decrease in uh, dry matter intake. Now, why don't these match up? Okay, that's one of the obvious questions. Um, these cattle were sitting in a barn, they were kind of bored. They will sit there and they'll start sorting through their feed. And so the feed we put out in front and what they actually consumed and what was left at the end of the day weren't always exactly the same. Okay. Here's kind of the big highlights of the study that I think are, this is where I get kind of excited. Um, in particular, urinary nitrogen was decreased when we fed the ractopamine. Okay. Now, when we just fed ractopamine, we saw about a 5 gram per day reduction in nitrogen excretion in the urine. Okay, and this is particularly important when we're looking at ammonia emissions because most of the nitrogen that's going to be present in the in the urine is going to be in the form of urea. Okay, once that urea enters into the environment, it can be transformed into ammonia via urease, and then it can rapidly leave that feedlot or dairy or wherever operation we're talking about here. Okay. So this is going to be a big driver of ammonia emissions from this type of feeding operation. So we saw a 5 gram per day reduction when we fed the ractopamine. When we had those steers implanted and we fed ractopamine, we saw almost a 20 gram per day reduction in urinary nitrogen. Okay, that, That's starting to get really huge. Okay, Now, if you go look at the literature, um, a lot of the studies that have been coming out will say that there's very little interaction between implant status and the use of ractopamine. Again, go back to the beginning of our talk. One of the big things that we did different here was rather than start feeding ractopamine when these steers were 70, 80 days post implant, we started feeding ractopamine about 50 days post implant. Okay, so they still had more of the trembolone acetate estradiol circulating in their system. Okay. Um, we also saw that they had the urea component of that urinary, urinary nitrogen was also decreased, but we did not see a decrease in nitrogen de retention. It tended to mirror what we were seeing here. Uh, basically, we had some large error bars. You know, this was uh, did not come out significant, so I'm not sure what all that's going to mean in the long run. Okay. Uh, at the end of the day, results indicated that urinary nitrogen excretion can be reduced by incorporating the ractopamine, may be enhanced by uh, implant status in the steers. Um, obviously, we got to do a lot more research with this, look at different types of implant strategies, timing, uh, to figure out what would be the most effective. Okay. Now, big implications of that study. Okay, if we just used um, some of the numbers we got out of out of there using that uh, those reductions, and if we had a 50,000 head feedlot, that would equate to possibly a 650 kilogram reduction in urinary nit nitrogen per day on that feedlot if all the animals in there were receiving it. Okay, for however long you you may have done that treatment. Okay, obviously we haven't validated this over the entire time of feeding rectopamine. There's a lot of yeah buts that could go into that. All right. Um, other big things that I wanted to bring up with this is when we're looking at management techniques, particularly within a a time setting like not trying not to have emissions during the springtime or the early summer. Okay. Maybe that's a time when our feedlot operators 
might want to go with more aggressive implant strategies. May go with some of these combinations of using fractopamine and implants, okay, which we know may have a detrimental effect on meat quality, okay, may decrease quality grades, things like that. But if you're still getting in your meat produced, that might off that might be a time where the benefit is offset by the cost that you'll lose uh, due to the decreased carcass quality. Okay, real quickly, we'll run through a few other management techniques that are out there. Phase feeding. I'm amazed at this one. It's been around for a really long time. Okay, and we seem to keep rediscovering this. Okay, that young growing animals and more mature animals have different requirements. If they're laying down a bunch of muscle or they're starting to get fat like me, okay, they're going to have different nitrogen requirements, different protein requirements. Okay, and the idea there is that you just adjust that nitrogen provision with each stage of growth. We've looked at other things like oscillating protein, changing how we're feeding um, nitrogen in the diet, trying to create some gradients, stimulate urea recycling within that animal, get that animal to reuse the urea rather than excrete it out in the, the environment. All these are great ideas, but one of the big challenges we come up against is that most feedlots are going to be very ration adverse. Okay, I've talked to a lot of different feedlot operators around the country. And they want to feed the bare minimum diets on their operation as possible. Uh, a lot of the comments that have come back is we have a hard enough time getting them to feed the right rations to the right pens in the right timing as it is. We go and we, but even if we just had two different protein levels, we just doubled the number of chances for confusion on the operation. Now, where that becomes particularly problematic in a feedlot is you're already kind of balancing on a knife edge of sending these animals into some sort of digestive upset, something like that. You really don't want to run the risk of that. Okay? So when we look at potential uh, management systems for mitigation, big things we have to keep in mind is they have to be relatively cheap and not impair performance. It's where those implants were really useful. A lot of them, they may be paying two, three dollars for the implant. They, and over the time of that feeding situation in our study, those steers gained about 70 pounds more. Okay, let's just say it was a dollar per pound of live weight on that animal. That's 70 dollars more for a two, three dollar investment. That makes sense to the producer. That's something they may do anyways. Okay, need to look for those types of, of options. Um, to be able to be continually used or may be able to use rapidly for those time periods when we may need to mitigate ammonia emissions, may need to be linked with some of the early warning systems like Jade mentioned, mentioned earlier, uh, and may be able to help us create some temporal spots where we reduce our emissions, as well as changing uh, what we're doing on the manure management sides of things. Okay, um, so I'm about out of time, so I'll entertain any questions right now. Uh, we don't know RDP off the top of my head. I know crude protein was running right at 13 and a half. Okay. Um, there was urea in the, in the diet. It was probably, my best guess is probably around 7% dry matter was RDP. In the re so the reduction was when we looked at total in reduction in the urine that was significant. When we looked at just urea reduction, it was in that p value of about 0.12, where it might be re getting s tendencies to have an impact there. So it looked like it wasn't just urea or urea emissions in the urine that was being reduced. Um, but maybe some other protein turnover, particularly things like creatinine, which we didn't measure. So I can't tell you really all the mechanisms, how that was being reduced. Um, well, I, I was looking for the percent reduction. So if, oh, oh, so just percent of excretion. On yeah, so um, these steers, oh, I want to say it was running somewhere around 
grams to 100 grams. So you, 20, 25 or higher. So it's very substantial.